only good. He was always good. And uh, along the way, different times preaching, and then in my own life as well, uh, make the suggestion to, to work on that doctrine. You know, it encompasses the goodness of God, certainly touches on his grace and uh, his, uh, his kindness. I think Deb Blanchard just did one for the ladies right on Chesed, on the, the, the uh, love, uh, loving kindness of God, the covenant loyalty as part of his goodness. Uh, but I challenge myself, and I've challenged in different times from the pulpit, uh, that's one of those attributes of God that is it's good to think ahead on. Uh, because it's easy to talk about the goodness of God when the blessings are flowing and things are good and the sun is shining. But it's when God allows, God brings in uh, difficulties, uh, health challenges, financial crisis, whatever it might be. But to have locked into our minds, God is always good, uh, that he is working in our hearts um, in the challenging times, and that he is still only good. And so we want to think about that. Our series today, we continue with this one on the blood and the leaven. And uh, we're looking in Exodus chapter 12. And I don't have an outline today. This is just the title here. The, the title today is this idea of the symbolic significance of the Passover feast, Feast of Passover, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so these are the first two of the spring feast, and we are challenged here uh, with several things out of Exodus 12, and we'll give you a little bit of the background again on that, but uh, that what we are going to be uh, unpacking today in this, kind of unpeeling, these two are meshed together very closely, but they are separate, uh, they are separate feasts, though they are uh, in the calendar back to back. Uh, they are two separate feasts, and um, they're, they're connected, they're related, but we want to peel them apart. I'll make just a couple comments starting out here. We are cautious uh, in typology, so we're, we're, and by that we mean um, the Bible does present, often in the Old Testament, a type. And so there might be a main character, there might be a main event, there might be a significant thing, in this case a feast. Um, and it is a picture, it is, uh, it is an exemplar, it is a type, is, is the biblical word, um, which is then fulfilled or amplified in the New Testament. And we are, we're cautious, and that, by that I mean um, not every story is a type of Christ, not every story is a type of something else. Uh, some of them are stories that teach other lessons, they're just stories, they're, they're stories teaching lessons. But in this case, uh, we are very comfortable saying this is, a, this is a biblically endorsed picture or a biblically endorsed type because we have this significant event, Passover itself, and the things that go with it, and the celebration of the feast, the elements that are part of it. And then over in the New Testament, we have a description generally of, of Christ, John 1, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We, we have a connection there. But more than that, the big one would be 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You remember we read, I think, last week uh, that now Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And so we are comfortable connecting the two, be, not because I dreamt it up or someone else thought, oh, wow, this sounds cool, uh, but because the Bible itself says, listen, the things that happened in, in the Old Testament, this one in particular, the Passover, uh, was significant historically for Israel. And I'll mention a couple of the, the things with that. But the symbolic significance is it ties into Christ, who is the Lamb of God, who is the Passover Lamb. And so we want to work on that. I want to take the time to read Exodus 12, um, most of the chapter, uh, just to give the background. Again, you, you recognize that this is at the end of the sojourn of the Israelites in Egypt. Um, in fact, the, at, at the beginning, they've been here 400 or 430 years. This is about 430 years uh, since they came down um, uh, under Joseph um, with, the, with the famine and so on. And so it's been several generations. They came down, a small group, what was it, 70 or 72 or 76 souls, I think, something like that. And they're going to leave, um, in fact, it's in this text, I don't think I'll read the exact thing, but 600,000 fighting men. It's a, you know, the numbers of the people leaving Egypt, if you have read a little bit on that, uh, of the totality of the Israelite population vary between, uh, on the very low end, one million, but probably two to five million people 
left Egypt and wandered around the wilderness. It's a lot of people. Uh, but in any event, uh, this is the beginnings of the formation of Israel, not as a family or a clan or a bunch of tribes, but as Israel the nation. Uh, that'll probably be um, of, of officially made at, the, at Mount Sinai with the giving of the law. But in any event, this is at the end of the sojourn in Egypt, 430 years. And God is now going to lead them out uh, with Moses uh, leading the way to the promised land. This is the one that was promised to Abraham under the Abrahamic covenant. So there's a lot of historic things going on. We're narrowing our focus uh, here to these two feasts, the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Allow me to read it. This is the actual uh, night. This is actually the event of that day. Um, the Passover celebration will be celebrated year by year if they're faithful, if they obey, through the ages, through the years. But this is the actual night when the Passover, the Passover lamb of history was slain and the actual uh, avenging angel, the, de the death angel came through and passed over those who had the blood on the doorpost. So let me read it. Uh, a couple of the sections, for sake of time, I'll, I'll summarize. But I'm beginning in verse 1. And so listen to some of these details of the Passover, and then it flows into the unleavened bread. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, verse number 1, in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months, the first month of the religious calendar, by the way. Uh, and it's named Nisan, uh, is the name of the month. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each uh, can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord." The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague shall be, uh, will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of e Egypt. This day, verse 14, shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. A statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. Seven days, and here's the, be the beginning of the instruction on unleavened bread. Uh, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days, but what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month, from the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwelling places you shall eat unleavened bread." Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of this house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door 
and will not allow the destroyer to enter the, uh, your houses to strike you. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the people of Israel went and did so. As the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. The next section, the next four or five verses, is that tenth plague. It is the actual night of Passover. And at midnight, it says, the Lord struck down all those who did not have the blood on the doorpost. And so uh, all throughout Egypt, and if there were any uh, Israelites who did not do it, we're not told specifically, but if there were any who did not do it, uh, the firstborn would die, man and beast. And throughout all of Egypt, there was a wailing and so on. And it's at that point, this is the tenth plague. It's at that point in that night when Pharaoh calls Moses and Aaron says, get out of here, get, leave us, uh, or we're all going to die. Uh, the next section, beginning of verse 33, is the actual exodus. And they leave in haste. They spoil the Egyptians of their uh, gold and silver. Um, they have unleavened bread on their breadboards, and they carry that with them, the dough. Uh, to, to, because of their haste, and they leave. And it tells us in verse 40, it had been 430 years. I'm going to read verse 43 to the end of the chapter then. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it. But every slave that is, brought for, uh, that is bought rather, for money may eat of it after you have circum circumcised him. No foreigner or hired servant may eat of it. It shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. All that the congregation of Israel shall keep it. If a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. All the people of Israel did just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. And so a historic event. Again, if you have grown up in church, especially as a youngster, you have heard this story. The story of the ten plagues and the story of the Passover probably more than once, and so it's a familiar story. I want to look at it in a little different way, the, the symbolic significance, and there are four or five items as we kind of work our way through here that are, this is a significant uh, historically, so we want to mention that, but we want to look at the significance uh, in connection to Christ the Passover lamb and tie, tie these two feasts together and actually uh, peel them apart a little bit and see some, some things that are very um, important, very big picture item as we read in our Bibles and think on, on scriptural truths. So here we are. The first observation, first thing I want to mention is that this presents, for these two, um, these two feasts, present uh, dual truths. There, there's a two-sided, two great themes that are found here that are pictured in these two closely related feasts. And again, they are closely related enough that uh, in Jesus' day, they become almost one. Hey, we're having Passover, and by that you might mean Passover and unleavened bread. Um, and if you're saying, well, we're, it's, the, it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you probably mean both unleavened bread and the Passover. And we recognize that. There's a close connection. There's a close connection historically. They are one after the other. What we want to do is note some significant differences. That, that what is the tie together? And so that's what we're going to develop. But there's a... There's a Two great themes that we're going to explore in this. And the application is not only to Christ and Christian living, but it, it's uh, actually found throughout Scripture. So follow with me. The two, the two great truths, or the two great themes that we're exploring here is, number one, and so this is kind of the conclusion brought up to the front of the, of the message. Number one, big truth is, eternal life is a free gift. So the Passover relates specifically to the sacrificial death of, of Christ, the Lamb of God, for the sins of people. Uh, he died for us. He is that Lamb. He fulfills what, what the Passover pictured um, in, in its fullness. He is that Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb. And we understand, th these are just statements here, of, of this first great theme, this first great tr uh, truth is that eternal life as the gift of God is found by simple faith alone. 
only faith, faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Uh, that simple faith connects the sinner with the grace of God and brings about new life. What kind of life? Eternal life. When a sinner comes to understand he's a sinner, when a sinner comes to the cross and accepts that gift of Jesus Christ in his place, his substitutionary death, by faith alone. Um, and that's pictured in the Passover with that, the blood, the blood of this innocent lamb sacrificed on behalf of that household, on those individuals, and the blood applied. The fulfillment is in, uh, in the actuality of Christ's death on the cross, and when his blood, his death, is applied to you and to me, by faith, uh, we are connected to God. That new life comes about, eternal life, the very life of God within the sinner. And this uh, gracious action on God's part is unconditional on ours. The only thing that is needed, and it's not a work, is the receipt by faith. God offers it. He calls to be whosoever will may come. Uh, for God so loved the world that whoever, whosoever, believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so in this, this great truth, this, this side of the coin, if you will, of what we're talking about today, is that Passover pictures for us that unconditional grace of God. The only action is the, the faith responding to the offer, pictured in Passover by the blood applied to the doorpost. And so uh, this is entirely apart from works of any kind. You, you can read, there are several passages in the Old Testament. Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy expand a little bit here and there on the Passover. And there is no work on the part um, of the person, of the household. Uh, the only work in quotes would be the putting to death of the lamb and so on, the selecting of the lamb. But it is the lamb's sacrifice, apart from human effort, apart from human work, that is the payment. And in that regard, it pictures very well the sacrifice of Christ. He died for us. We receive that by faith alone. And there's no work on our parts. And we're reminded that in many places. We think of um, Galatians 2, verse 16. Uh, that, uh, that For by works of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, very familiar to us. We've looked at this several times. This is a good text to have in reference to witnessing. But it says there, even though we're sinners, that God interrupted us. And in verse 8 of Ephesians 2, for by grace are you saved by faith. Uh, it is not of yourselves. It is the, thank you, the gift of God. Uh, uh, not, not of works lest any man should boast. There is a, a complete separation. And that deal of salvation, justification, salvation, uh, the New Testament writers concur with the picture of the Passover lamb. There is no human effort. There's no human merit. Um, you know, Titus 3, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but what? According to his mercy, he saved us. And so it is completely apart. So that's one great truth that is pictured in this Passover uh, feast. It has its own historic significance. This is, the, this is the redemption of Israel and the coming out of the land. This is the final of the ten plagues. They're going to come out. They're going to go through the wilderness experiences. A lot, a lot historically and, and uh, symbolically as well, but a lot historically. But the symbolic s significance that we're looking at today is the picture or the symbolism of the Passover feast and its original initiation, the night it happened, pictures for us the free gift of God. He redeemed, he saved, he passed over these people, not because of their own works, uh, not because of their own merits, but because they had put the blood of an innocent lamb on the doorposts. The second great truth, uh, first one is eternal life is the gift of God. The second great truth that's found in these two feasts together and is uh, further expanded in many places in the scriptures is that, um, that God rewards afterwards a life of faith, uh, that is obedience. And so rewards, on the other hand, uh, as, as an opposition or contrast to simple faith of salvation and justification, rewards, on the other hand, uh, including such things as God's approval. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Uh, 
uh, including such things as the crowns. That's a, another study. Uh, you know, there are at least five different crowns that are listed in the New Testament. Uh, not listed, not connected directly to just being saved, but connected to save people who live for God. In other words, this is now conditional. This is now meritorious. This is now a reward. And so rewards uh, are different than the, the, the eternal life gift. They are, uh, they include fatherly approval, well done, good and faithful servant. They include crowns. And I actually think the crowns are maybe one of the minor things. We tend to focus on that. Uh, but the crowns, they include positions, ranks, and opportunities in, in the eternity, in the coming kingdom. I think that's really the bigger deal. To, be, to serve God faithfully today in this life in such a way that he says, well done, good and faithful servant. And if you remember those parables, it goes on to say, enter into the joy of your Lord. Come and take charge, rule over this city or that territory or that. I'm giving you another job to do because you have been faithful. And so rewards, in contrast to the, to the gift of God of eternal life, rewards um, are conditional. Uh, they are based according to post-salvation works. And so in this thought, after eternal life has been received freely as a gift from God's gracious hand, here enters merit, here enters effort, here enters striving and labor. And if you're thinking along the lines that I am, I am pointing you on today, this is where a lot of passages, Old Testament to a degree, but especially New Testament, we have so many commands, uh, you know, labor and strive and work and uh, be faithful and do this and do that and continue. That is not to earn our salvation. We are talking about those who are saved, those who have been justified freely by grace. The call is, come live as my people, serve me faithfully. And so uh, these kind of phrases show up in many texts. Uh, the idea of striving, of laboring for, for the master. Uh, and in fact, it is the works then, works which will be given account of before the judgment seat of Christ. And it raises a question for the believer to ponder, what are the effects? If, if you are here today and know Christ, and I know that's probably everybody, hopefully everybody, um, here today, but here's the question for a believer, one who has put faith in Christ to think about. What are the effects of good or evil, good or bad works, on the future position of one like us who is already justified? We've already been declared righteous. We've already received the forgiveness of sins. What then does today's living, good or bad, affect? And there's, there are several texts. One, just to bring to mind here to, to highlight this, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, a reminder, for we must all appear before the judgment seat, which is the Bema there, that's the Bema, we've talked about that not too long ago, the judgment or Bema seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether, remember the end of the verse? whether the works, the things done, are good or bad. And so that's, that's really the heart of what we're developing, and it is pictured, it is symbolized in the Passover and the Unleavened Bread. I, again, want to emphasize that the doctrine of reward for good works, which is a major theme, applies only to those who have already been justified freely through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight that here in the message as we go along. This dual truth, this two-sided uh, principle, this, this uh, uh, two aspects of, of key themes in the Bible, of doctrine, once we grab onto that, once we grasp it well, opens for us uh, new vistas, new scenery, a panoramic view of life and of God and of the world and of the scriptures and it clears the fog from many seemingly challenging texts, many, many challenging, puzzling passages. And so we want to we think about that a little bit today. We have this issue here. Christ, our Passover, 1 Corinthians 5. The Lamb's blood of the Passover actual event typifies uh, Christ's blood. 
And the verse in 1 Corinthians 5 goes on and says, Let us therefore keep the feast. Let us now presently keep the feast of unleavened bread. And so that's where we want to go in just a moment. The second main element, first one is those two truths, dual truths of eternal life. Forgiveness of sins is a free gift. Unconditioned on human worthiness, not based on our works. We can't earn it. It is a free gift. The second dual truth, second of the two, is that rewards are meritorious. We do serve the Lord uh, as he enables us for his glory. But those are meritorious. There is an accounting for those works. We actually give an account for our works. Point number two today out of the Passover and the unleavened bread, and I'm back in Exodus 12 now, is this concept that the blood of the Passover points to Christ, the true Passover lamb. All right? The blood of the Passover uh, in that day, the, the lamb, the physical woolly lamb, points to Christ, the true Passover lamb. And we already mentioned the setting here in Exodus. Uh, they are in Egypt. They've been here 430 years, according to the text. And uh, they've been now in the last bit, the last quite a while, in slavery. They are they're no longer freemen as they went in. They have been in slavery now for some period of time. Uh, and you even remember the background, the story of Moses and his birth. And that he was, by law, Egyptian law, was supposed to be put to death, but his parents disobeyed because they trusted God. And the whole thing, the slavery and the, the, the troubles that they were in, the people of Israel in Egypt. And so at this time, this, it is now the first, it's going to become the first month of the religious calendar year for Israel. Uh, again, called Nisan. Uh, and it's approximately our March, April. On the 10th of that month, they set aside the lamb. So they go out to their flocks and they pick one. It has to be, and this is where we can see very close matchings or uh, fulfillments in Christ. They, they, um, on the 10th of the month, they go to the flocks and they pick either a, a goat or a lamb, the text tells us. But it needs to be without blemish, a male, a year old. Uh, and so nothing wrong. It's in perfect health. And, uh, and this fits well. This is a different study, but if, if when we get a chance, uh, maybe this spring or sometime, um, this is fulfilled literally in Christ, by the way. Uh, there's probably a time on the 10th of that month when he is publicly uh, acclaimed. He is publicly announced as the Lamb. We'll deal with that at, at another time. On the 14th, um, towards twilight, the Lamb is slain. And again, a reminder that, that the Jewish day the beginning of their day is approximately 6 p.m. at sunset. All right, so before sunset on the 14th. So, you know, if it's around, if it was around now, sunset's what, 5 o'clock now? It's pretty early. Uh, it would be before then, and then the new day starts. And then the lamb would be eaten on that next day, which is in the evening, all right? Uh, and so, but the, the point we're getting at, so that's on, on the 15th, the lamb is eaten. That's the actual eating the celebration of the Passover. And those things will be applied specifically, accurately, and actually to Jesus Christ in the history of the cross. That's not our big purpose today, but I'm just connecting it for you. The point we want to make here is that this blood of the Passover pointing to Christ, the true Passover lamb, we notice this in verse 7 of chapter 12. The first main command is this, verse 7, then they shall take some of the blood Take the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel. Apply the blood. All right? Apply the blood. The application of the blood. And again, the, the issue here is historically with Passover and theologically or spiritually with each of us with Christ in the Passover setting, it's the word I use is passive. This is not a meritorious work, um, even though they, their arm moves up and I understand that. But the, it is the blood of the lamb applied to that doorpost of that household that fulfills the requirements. And in doing so, uh, it avoids the death angel. The death angel, the destroying angel, that night would seek out every single house in Egypt. Every single one. But when it saw the blood on the door, the, the death angel would pass over. Uh, where the blood was applied, why would he pass over? Well, I mean, because of obedience to what God has said, but the principle, the underlying concept, the underlying why, 
is that the death angel passed over that house because death had already come. The, the price had already been paid. And you can see the application, not just historically, that's what was going on in freeing Israel from Egypt and those things. But for us, it pictures when you and I came to Christ, we understand that some 2,000 years ago, Jesus, the very Son of God, came in human form, the God-man, and he died on the cross, shedding his blood, as his blood being the payment price. And when that blood, when that sacrifice was applied to my heart by faith, not because I actually saw real blood, you know that, this is, this is a theological or spiritual sense, but when that blood of Jesus was applied to my heart, the judgment of God passed over me. I no longer will face condemnation, John 5, 24. I've come into life, uh, passed from death to life, and I will never see judgment for my sins. Not eternal judgment. Why? Because they have already been paid for. The death of Jesus, the blood specifically, paid that price. And so there's a tremendous connection here. The blood of the Passover lamb of history points to the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. But in the Passover night, into every house, from the least to the greatest, no excuses, no exceptions, no get-arounds, no do-overs, into every house, from the least to the greatest, where the blood was not applied, where no blood was on the doorpost, death came. And this is, a, is an overwhelming thing. It's hard to sit here in a comfortable room, uh, worshiping God, listening to a message, and, and ponder, uh, you know, if you live near the borders between Israel and Egypt of that night, uh, you know, if, you're, if across the street were, were the Egyptian territory, if that's where you lived, you, could, you would hear wailing and weeping. As, as the oldest passed into eternity. Because they had not obeyed God. They had not accepted the free gift. They had not put the blood on the doorpost. No exceptions, no excuses, no other way. And, and by the way, this little parenthesis, that fits, again, in our culture, we're very uh, pluralistic. You know, all, uh, you know the, the saying, all roads lead to Rome. The concept in America is, if there is even a heaven and, and afterlife, uh, then all roads lead to heaven, right? That's the concept in our culture. And we have to disabuse people scripturally. There is no other way but Jesus Christ. There is only one way to heaven. I'm reminded of John 14, 6, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. That's the only way. And we don't proclaim it because we're better than somebody else. We, we still fought the mercy of God. We're amazed at God's grace in our lives, aren't we? We're, you and I are not saved because we're better than your, your next door neighbor. Uh, God didn't save us because, you know, we're a little bit less of a sinner. <laughs> he saved us because he's gracious. And we want to tell others there is a way. For sin to be covered, it is the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, no exceptions, no excuses. But, where this goes now, is to, um, to the Lord's Passover, leads into the, the festival, or the feast, of unleavened bread. And I'm picking up now in verses 12 to 15. And here, we see that the feast of unleavened bread highlights the necessity of living for God as pure uh, as pure people, being holy as God is holy. Here's what we see in verses 12 to 15. And so we've read, put on the blood, apply the blood to the doorpost. Verse 12, um, is that the verse I want? I'm sorry, verse 15 is the verse I want. Uh, verse 15 of chapter 12. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day, and here's the second major command, and it applies to, to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. And what we have here is this second, the first command was put the blood on. That is first in priority, it is first in sequence, it is first in necessity. But having done that, 
the, the feast of, the, of Passover leads into the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the historical celebratory sequence. But in our symbolism, it goes from the blood of Christ applied to my heart is justification. Apart from works by God's grace, it is his shed blood, the shed blood of Christ that saves me. Having thus been justified, the call now is put the leaven out of the house. What does that picture? What's the connection here? And again, that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Christ, our Passover uh, lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the, the festival, keep the festival of unleavened bread, not with the old leaven of malice, but with the unleavened uh, of righteousness. And so what, what's pictured here, what is being said is, we who have been justified, if you are here today, and I think it's all of you, it's the majority of you, whoever it is, that has trusted Christ, you've been justified freely by his grace. The call now pictured in these two festivals is put the leaven out of our houses. What does that mean in practical terms? Sin. Leaven often represents sin. And what goes on here in the Feast of Unleavened Bread is, they, in, in the case of the festival, in the case of the feast, uh, of the celebration week, it is an actual physical thing. They would search out throughout the house very carefully, the, the observant Jews, even to this day, uh, and they will get rid of anything. So, any, and, and again, in case anyone doesn't know, I, you probably do, leaven, the word we would use is probably the word yeast, all right, yeast, unleavened or unyeasted uh, bread, uh, but any, a piece of bread, got to go. Um, probably most of us have a jar of... Uh, is it Fleischmann's or whatever, the, the, the yeast in the freezer it stays that way? It's got to go. It's got to leave the house. And there are stories. I've read one or two here and there. You know, an observant Jew, they get partway through the feast and something happens and they open a cupboard and behind the peanut butter or whatever, uh, they find, you know, somebody had dropped some crumbs and they had missed it somehow. And they, they, are, they are aghast. You know, again, we could, we could chuckle at or something, but no, this is serious to them. And they, won't, they don't even want to touch the leaven at that point. You, know, you get a brush and you put it in a pan and you get it out of the house. And what this is picturing, th this is a new diet. I'm not, I'm not promoting a new diet for you, you know, the, the new unleavened diet or something. No, what we're picturing is what you mentioned, sin. Leaven pictures sin. And the seriousness of sin in our lives. What a challenge. This is a call to holy living. Be holy as I am holy. Do you remember uh, Psalm 139, David's psalm? Do you remember that one? I think at the, it's beginning and end. It opens with almost the same wording. Search me, O God, and, and see if, uh, try my heart, see if there be any wicked way in me. That's a neat study on its own. But it fits here day by day. We don't have to wait for the springtime. We don't have to line it up with March, April, and, and so on. As a principle, you and I, on a regular basis, the, the application, the truth, the lesson of unleavened bread is God wants us to live unleavened lives. We who are justified freely are to live lives apart from sin. And where the Spirit of God touches our hearts and says, you know, that habit, that thing, that process, that, that response you have to this, that, or the other that you've been doing for years, you know, he, he reveals it in a message through his word, through our devotions, whatever it might be. And the Spirit lays on our heart, that's not pleasing to me. That's, that's a sinful way to live. That's a sinful thought. That's a sinful desire. And what ought we to do? What is the lesson of the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Seek it out. Allow God to show us and seek it out in our hearts, and then we get rid of it. And again, the, the Israelites in the practice, those who are practicing Jews even this day, are, they are assiduous with this. They are, they are fastidious with it. Uh, they are exacting with it. Even a crumb, even the dust from bread would, would be displeasing to them. And you and I ought to have the same kind of attitude you know, if I put it, if I frame the question this way, you know, hey, you know, between you and me, uh, do you think just little sins are okay? You know, as long as they're not big ones, it's not, sin's okay, right? Just a little bit. And the answer, the lesson, the principle from the Feast of Unleavened Bread is, no, 
seek it out diligently, no matter how small, and by God's grace, get rid of it. It's actually quite, quite an interesting concept. And this, this plays into some big picture items. That's what God is doing in our lives. Even if you've been saved, you know, I've been saved for quite a while now. Some of you have been saved longer than I have. But God, from time to time, reveals, like, here's an attitude. Here's a part of your heart that is still not lining up with what I want. Here, here's a rebellious thought. Here's, you know, uh, a fear. Here's, here's a wrong attitude. Whatever it might be to change our hearts so that we're more like Jesus Christ day by day. And so I noticed this second command, it follows the first, the put off, the put away, to get rid of the leaven, even from the first day, put it out. And so there is the need, the command, to rid the house, that is our lives, of sin. And of great significance, and I'll, I'll develop this in just a minute, it, is that it follows, it, uh, it comes after the application of the blood. The blood is first, and then getting rid of the leaven is next. Two more points here briefly, and, and this is just kind of very quickly. Number one, the dual truth revealed. So we've talked about this dual truth. The freeness of eternal life, unconditioned, other than the response of faith, and then the truth that the rewards are based on merit. The rewards are based on our labor for the master. And so we see on the one side, uh, the free gift, is, is uh, conditioned on putting on the blood. Our sanctification, our living for Christ, is putting out the leaven. Uh, the, the, the justification on the one hand and sanctification on the other. The one is Christ's work for us. He died in our place. He shed his blood. In this case, it is the Spirit's work in us. Uh, in, the, in the first case, again, it is passive. We, by faith, Passively, that is, we're not doing work, we receive by faith the gift of forgiveness and eternal life. But in sanctification, it is an act of faith in obedience. We do. We seek out sin and put it out. We follow. We live. We pray. We work. We labor. Uh, this is a personal appropriation. Again, receiving it by faith. Here it is personal activation in sanctification. Uh, the one, the first, is a positional reality. Uh, the second is practical experience. This is the living of the Christian life. And I note this quickly, but importantly, we observe that there is no command to put out the leaven before putting on the blood. And that There's the significance. In order to come to Christ, we don't have to clean up our lives and get rid of this, that, or the other. What we need is the blood of Christ applied. That's first. That's, there's a significance to this order. Passover, apply the blood. Now that that's happened, get sin. Get leaven out of the house. Get sin out of the life. And so the, the concept would be this. We're, we don't need, we don't, we're not to attempt to cleanse the house, clean up the sinner uh, from leaven before it is presented to God for the blood. We need the blood first of all. Um, Last point, and we'll close with this. It's interesting that there are serious consequences for either one. Here's what's at stake. Serious, dire consequences in both cases of the Passover and of the unleavened bread. Um, regarding the Passover, uh, to not apply the blood, and we read the text, I'm not going to reread it right now, but to, if, if you go back and reread the chapter, if someone were to not apply the blood, what happens? They are struck down by God in Egypt immediately. And in fact, even if the house had been clean from leaven, if for some reason somebody said, ah, I'm not going to do the blood thing, but I'm going to clean up the leaven, what happens? Blood not on the door. God, and, uh, through the person of the, the, the death angel, strikes death into that house no matter what. And it would seem to symbolize, the connection symbolically, theologically is, we're talking about eternal life issues here, found in Christ. If the blood of Jesus is not applied to someone's heart, your friend, your neighbor, your loved one, if they do not accept Jesus, if they do not accept the blood of Jesus in their place, what happens? God judges, and it is eternal death. That's how serious that one is. But how about the leaven? 
for you and me who are sitting here, I think, again, we're believers. We have trusted Christ as Savior. What's the consequence? It's still pretty serious to not get rid of the leaven, to say, ah, it's too much work. I'll do it next year. Whatever excuse you give. To, to, in the text, what was it? Remember the wording? They would be cut off from Israel. You can read, read it two or three times there in the text. They would be cut off from Israel. What does that mean? It means they were put to death and put, put away from Israel. They, they were gotten rid of, not by God, by the people, but it is a serious consequence in this life. They would be justified, but not finished in their sanctification. And so it, the, the application, of course, for us is very serious. Um, that we want to be people who are not only justified, that's eternal life. That makes our standing secure with God. But we want to live for Him. Get rid of sin. Yeah, get, get that out of our lives. Whatever it is, God might be speaking your heart on something this week, next week. Don't just say, hey, I'll live with it or we'll take care of it later. We need to take care of it now. They, the one who did not cast out the leaven would be eternally secure, but under God's discipline, under God's displeasure. Um, and so we want to be aware of that. The two together, these dual truths of justification or forgiveness of sins by the application of the blood and then the growth and grace that we might use New Testament language by getting sin out of our lives. Let's take our hymn books. We have a song that I think touches on that pretty well. Nothing Between is the song. 